Ladies and gentlemen, good day and welcome to the Ucro Capital Limited Q4 FY23 earnings call. At this moment, all participants are in the listen only mode. Later, we will conduct a question and answer session. At that time, you may click on the raise hand icon to ask a live question. Please note that this conference is being recorded. I now hand the conference over to Mr. Avinash Singh from MK Global Financial Services. Thank you and over to you sir. Yeah, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. On behalf of MK Global Financial Services, I welcome you all to the Q4 FY23 results conference call of Ugro Capital Limited. We have with us from the management Mr. Sachindranath, the Vice Chairman and Managing Director, Mr. Anuj Pandey, the Chief Risk Officer, Mr. Amit Mande, the Chief Revenue Officer, and Mr. Kishore Loda, the Chief Financial Officer. So without any further delay, I would like to hand over the floor to the management for their opening comments. Thank you and over to you, Kishore. Uh, good evening to all the participants. Uh, on behalf of Ugro Capital, we thank all the participants to take time out and participate in our investor call for the result of this quarter. We continue with our growth momentum where we have touched in year 6,000 crore versus 3,000 crore of last year, registering a growth of about 105%. Uh, I will quickly run you through the financial performance of the quarter as well as the, for the whole year. Uh, our gross disbursement stood at around 7,200 crore versus 3,138 crore during the previous year. Uh, we have emerged as the one of the fastest growing and one of the largest uh, lending as a service provider in co-lending space in MSME field, uh, where our uh, uh, total portion of our book balance sheet is about 40 percent and on book uh, portfolio is about 60 percent. Our total income increased by about 119 percent to 683 crore versus uh, 312 crore of the previous year. Total net income increased by about 123 percent uh, to 390 crore versus 175 crore of the previous year. Profit before tax has increased fourfold to 83 crore versus uh, 20 uh, crore of the previous year. And profit after tax stood at 39 crore versus uh, 14 crore during uh, the previous year. Uh, this year we have taken a one-time hit of 20.6 crore as a write-off on deferred tax asset. So if we adjust that, then our profit profit after tax would have been 60 crore versus 14 crore of the previous year. The company has delivered a rota of 1.1% during the uh, year, if we adjust here with the deferred tax adjustment, then it would have been 1.7 percent, vis-a-vis 0.6 percent of the previous year. Uh, as a result, this company has delivered ROE of uh, 4.1 percent, and then on an adjustment basis, it is about 6.2 percent. Uh, this was 1.5 percent during the previous year, so we have increased fourfold uh, increase in ROE as well. Uh, quarter on quarter profitability is uh, steadily increased. Last quarter our PBT was about 22 crore. This quarter time it is about 33 crore. Uh, so we have seen another good uh, quarter in terms of profitability. Our cost to income ratio is steadily going down. Last year we had cost to income ratio about 72 percent. This year uh, full year basis so we have come down to 62 percent. And on the quarterly basis, this quarter it is roughly around 59%. And as a guidance, we will continue to have this path. And next year, we will uh, go down to about 47% as cost to income ratio. So our overall debt uh, stood at about 3,149 crore as on 31st March 2023. And leverage is about 3.2 uh, times. Uh, our capital adequacy was about 20% uh, uh, for the year ended 31st March 2023. This is this does not include the capital raise which we have done in the month of April and May. As you all of you must be aware that in the month of April we have launched a QIP and a preference issue where we have raised 340 crore. 240 crore has been done through the preferential issue route where Denmark government sovereign arc IOC participated and invested 242 crore and QIP was uh, completed during the month of April where 100 uh, crore was raised through uh, domestic institutions where some of the large uh, insurance companies participated as primary participant of the issue. 
uh, overall uh, the credit quality has remained quite stable our gross NP has come down from 2% to 1.6% and net NP has gone down from 1.6% to 0.9% uh, which is quite healthy uh, overall PCR has gone up from 26% to uh, 48% during the year. Uh, overall, borrowing cost has remained more or less stable for us. Uh, uh, during the quarter, the borrowing cost has gone up by about 7 basis points from 10.5 to 10.57%. And for the whole year basis, where the overall rate has increased by 225 basis points for the market, our overall borrowing cost has gone up from 10.3% to 10.57%, uh, registering over 27 basis point high on overall borrowing cost. With this, I hand it over to our Vice Chairman and Managing Director, Mr. Sachin Dhanna, to take you through our journey so far and, the, and our plans ahead. Over to you, Mr. Dhanna. Thank you, Kishore. Before actually we you know, start the formal presentation, all of you normally see the uh, quarterly result presentation, which is all about the numbers. As a young company, which has just started uh, its journey four years back, uh, we recently launched our brand campaign. And we wanted to show you the campaign itself. The reason that uh, why we wanted to show you the campaign is because it's a unique proposition for customer. And we have tried to deliver that proposition through, you know, what goes in lending uh, when we provide the instant credit. So it's a film about a business owner inquiring about the unavailability of the material due to shortage of funds. He sends an SOS via his mobile phone, which is represented in a bottled message and picked up by a Pelicon. How an analyst, you know, rep uh, uh, represented by a rooster, uh, you know, an emperor, you know, how the KYC, uh, how the large portion of data is used. And then within minutes, the credit is delivered, is represented by this field. Please watch. Hey, there's material yet? Sir, there's no money. Material, material, how will it come? Okay. टेंशन मत लो यू ग्रो कैपिटल का ग्रो एक्स ऐप है ना अब आपको भी मिल सकती है नॉन स्टॉप बिजनेस करने की आजादी इतनी जल्दी थैंक्स मूविंग ऑन एमएसएमई इन इंडिया हैव ट्रेडिशनली बीन ए क्रेडिट स्टाफ बिजनेस सेगमेंट वाइल एमएसएमई एम्प्लॉय हंड्रेड एंड टेन मिलियन पीपल एंड अकाउंट फॉर नियरली थर्टी परसेंट ऑफ द कंट्रीज जीडीपी हाउ they are generally you know <clears throat> suffer difficult time because of the late payment dispute uh, which suffocate their cash flow and the lending institutions have largely been reliant upon collateral uh, to provide loan to msme this is transitioning and we genuinely believe the next decade or two decades is the decade for msme financing in india what we have seen for consumer financing and we have seen multiple institutions getting built around that is the time has come wherein you know a few set of very you know uh, digitalized data would explode the credit uh, for msme uh, you know the advent of gst uh, and, and smaller entities are now fi finding it advantageous to report the top line uh, resulting in very robust compliance uh, if you combine the multiple other data set which is the banking data uh, which is the repayment behavior from bureau uh, and now there are more inputs which are getting, and you have the ability to combine this, you can actually genuinely assess the repayment capacity of a borrower, and that leads to the credit. While all of us as lenders continue to do pure cash flow based lending without collateral, with collateral, but eventually the, our belief is that the lending would not remain restricted purely based the collateral. Uh, the, there is a massive, you know, ecosystem around OKN account aggregation are getting built up. Uh, Ugro is pioneer in most of that. 
uh, and the following video will showcase you that how actually it is functioning before we do a quick deep dive in terms of what we have built around it. You grow capital, empowering MSME ecosystem. Is a lack of collateral coming your way to raise funds for your enterprise? Well, then cash flow based lending could be your solution. Cash flow based lending is an innovative approach that takes into account the complex nature of an MSME's cash flow, providing quick assessment of credit bases their cash flow projections, and with the evolution of GST and banking based models, powerful machine learning tools are now available to make this process even more efficient. To further leverage the digital revolution in finance, the government is also stepping in with initiatives like Open Credit Enablement Network, better known as OKN, and account aggregators. These initiatives will help the MSME segment to have access to easy and convenient credit. So, if you are an MSME struggling to access the funds you need to grow your business, cash flow based lending could be the solution you've been looking for. You grow capital, empowering MSME ecosystem. Thank you. I now hand over the conference to you know Mr. Anuj Pandey. Anuj, as you know, is our chief risk officer. Our entire technology uh, team and our data analytics team also reports into him. And he, you know, not only passionate about it, but obviously the entire ecosystem around our data and tech is built uh, basis uh, uh, the guidance and leadership which he provides along with his team. Over to you, Anuj. Uh, thank you, Sachin. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, 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 I, I, this is a good opportunity, actually, uh, to go uh, to look back. Uh, and I uh, wanted to tell you all when we had started in uh, 2018, uh, our uh, mission was uh, we used to call it solving the unsolved. And that uh, solution in our mind was to make a scientific template ad around underwriting to MSMEs, which is sustainable and scalable. And uh, in the next few slides, uh, I will demonstrate uh, 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 and uh, tell you what all we have achieved in that direction. So uh, this is uh, a short highlight slide on how we have scaled up and how the data system uh, ecosystem around us has also evolved. Just to uh, give you a few numbers, uh, in the last four years, uh, our proprietary growth code has been applied to 63,000 plus customers. Uh, we have analyzed uh, more than 1.9 lakh bureau records. We have analyzed more than 93,000 bank statements, and we have analyzed more than 34,000 GST records. Uh, and this has happened uh, because we have been able to make a platform where onboarding of documents by customer has been made seam seamless with a click of button. And on the back end, uh, there is a technology module which is working tirelessly 24 by 7. Um, this has resulted uh, in we having 48,000 customers live today. Uh, the gross banking turnover of the customers whom we serve is now close to 1.6 lakh crores. We are uh, into about 25% of the top uh, PIN codes in the country where the SME concentration is high. We serve more than 115 plus uh, anchors and OEMs. But what I am most excited to share is what the future is looking like and the power of network science uh, which we have uh, uh, which we now have the capability to see and in very short future to end cash uh, just to illustrate you today in our network uh, of customers we have demographic records of more than 25 lakh counterparties we cover more than 10 percent of india's registered companies and this is how this is what, what happens when, when there is a tipping point, we are reaching a tipping point where uh, uh, because of the GST linkages uh, in the ecosystem, uh, we will be able to identify and solve 
customers' working capital needs across uh, 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 the trade corridor. Today, uh, in our network, uh, we cover more than 95% of uh, India's top 500 companies and 19% of all GST registered companies are in one way or other part of the GST ecosystem of the companies which we serve directly. We have all set uh, uh, our data science team is working on cutting edge solutions and we are very confident that our stated goal of serving at least 1% of MSME lending market will be solved in near future. Uh, what uh, uh, what I, we will do now is to give you a glimpse of our latest version of Growth Score, which we internally call Growth Score 3.0, uh, and what it is capable of through a short video. India has seven crore MSMEs who encounter barriers to accessing easy credit due to lack of formal documentation and collateral. However, cash flow based lending has emerged as a revolutionary solution to address this challenge. To capitalize on this, you Grow Capital has developed Grow Score 3.0, an enhanced version of the proprietary scoring model Grow Score 2.0, by utilizing data from GST in conjunction with credit bureau and banking information. Imagine there's a small manufacturing company that makes custom furniture. Recently, they received an order for custom-made furniture, but to fulfill the order, they need immediate working capital to pay for raw material, new hirings, and other operating expenses. For that, they applied for instant credit with Ugro Capital and shared their GST data to support their application. Now, Ugro Capital will analyze the GST data provided by the furniture company to extract critical information such as sales momentum, purchase behavior, margins, scale of business, counterparty relationships, product mix, and filing discipline to calculate the grow score and predict the likelihood of the company repaying the loan. Based on the grow score, you grow capital will make a data-driven lending decision and offer access to the credit to the company at a reasonable rate. This is crucial for businesses that can't obtain loans without collateral or face high interest rate problems. By leveraging GST data alongside traditional credit banking information, you Grow Capital provides a streamlined lending process and quick access to credit when small businesses need it most. You Grow Capital, empowering MSME ecosystem. Uh, so you would have uh, uh, watched the video. I'll take uh, uh, a few minutes more uh, to explain the building blocks uh, of our flagship Growth Score 3.0. This is at the very heart of uh, the underwriting model which we have developed for SMEs. Uh, at, the, at the very basic, uh, this uh, uh, Growth Score is based on three components. Uh, we use uh, GST transaction data for last 24 months, uh, which is available on a click of button through consent of the customer. We take last 12 months bank statements of the customer, which again today is possible with a click of button, and the repayment history of the customer uh, from the credit bureau. Our belief uh, right from day one was that we should take documents uh, which are very easy to upload for the customer and at the same time gives us the most accurate picture of the current cash flows. So all our modeling has been done basis these three uh, 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 document sets. What we have done uh, uh, during the course, and currently we are in the third generation, that's why it's Growth Score 3.0, is that we have invested a lot and developed a very large library, which we call a feature library. What it does is it looks at all the possible parameters in the repayment history or in the banking transaction or the GST transaction which can have correlation with the future repayment behavior of the customer. And then we allow this data feature library to be accessed by the in-house developed machine learning platform. And what it does, it's that it, that it keeps triangulating these, this data and keeps check, checking with the corresponding future portfolio behavior of the customer. And during this process, it comes up uh, with a, with a uh, scorecard with the most important characteristics. The beauty of this model is 
that it it uh, keeps evolving on its own. Uh, uh, the Go score today, uh, which we have made, has the ability to predict probability of default for the next 12 months. So typically what we do is that we allow it to run for at least a year, look at the results, and the machine uh, then uh, uh, weighs in on how accurate it was, and then uh, if it re if required, changes itself. So this is a self-sustaining model, uh, and it has the capacity to keep enriching itself as more and more data feature is discovered. And finally, uh, uh, it's very important that we keep checking uh, whether the growth score which we have developed has been working well or not. And for that, uh, we, uh, we have arrived at a, a, a framework where not only we keep checking the repayment behavior of the customers whom we approve, uh, but also we keep checking the repayment uh, behavior of the customers whom we have not disbursed. Uh, and this allows us to not only get data of our own uh, uh, disbursements, but also what the customer and how the customer is behaving with other financiers. Just to uh, illustrate uh, uh, that, uh, we have made a, a very simple two-line graphs. The bottom line is uh, uh, the, repay, the portfolio behavior of the customers whom we have disbursed by the risk bands of growth score. Um, our growth score gives classification of customer in five risk bands, A, B, C, D, and E. A being the best customer, the probability of default for the next 12 months would be the least. And E being uh, uh, the worst customer where the probability of default in the next 12 months is higher. So what uh, the uh, picture on the left-hand side illustrates is that the risk ranking and the portfolio behavior as predicted by our growth score across risk bands A, B, C, D, E is not only holding for our own customers, but also for the customers who were scored, but not disbursed. Uh, so uh, across the width of the data which is available, uh, it is a proof uh, that it is working well. On the right hand side, it is uh, we have demonstrated the portfolio uh, uh, contribution by growth score and uh, currently approximately 88% of the portfolio uh, uh, customers have a growth score of A and B, which, act, which for the future gives us, which is very encouraging because we know that uh, overall the portfolio performance will continue to do well. Thank you. Now uh, I hand over uh, uh, the mic to Amit and he will take you through more business details. Over to you, Amit. <clears throat> so thank you, thank you all for joining the call. Uh, as we as we go ahead, just wanted to run you through our journey for last five years. This five years journey has been nothing but eventful. Uh, as you would recollect, we raised our first capital in July 2018, a capital of 900 crores, and we set this and we set set foot for this uh, interesting journey to really empower the MSME ecosystem. Uh, during these first six months, we built risk models, we built an entire sectoral approach, and we dispersed our first loan in Jan, Jan 19. Uh, I think that after that setup phase, when we were ready to really scale up, we saw two uh, macroeconomic events that would have, uh, uh, which were disruptive and that, that, changed, that kind of uh, changed the course. We had one INFS crisis that happened, and then, of course, in March 2020, COVID set in. Uh, by then, we had created a book of about 890 crores and 860 crores. And so, once the COVID had set in, we uh, we took a little pause. And that we had uh, the power of capital behind us, we decided to invest uh, our time and energies into building infrastructure, hiring the right set of people, building our technology stacks, and uh, continually uh, uh, enriching our risk models. Uh, so once once we had really built these blocks during our COVID times, once the COVID was past us, we started our growth phase. Since Q3 of 2021, we've been growing at a very brisk pace. We've all our asset engines and our investments in uh, infra and technology have been reaping benefits. Uh, 
people who've been following us would see that our uh, AUMs have seen steady growth since then. Um, we touched 6,000 crores of crore of AUM this March, and as we now go forward, we will continue to continue to harness the uh, harness the uh, efficiency of our gross core three model. We will continue to work scale our lending as a service model where we will have multiple partnerships on co-lending and co-origination. And more importantly, now that we have launched our direct-to-customer model, we will start acquiring large number of customers, which will only enrich our ecosystem that Anu spoke about through network sciences and ensure that we have we, have, we become a data powerhouse for the MSMEs. Uh, now that we are also supported by the capital raise that just happened in April, we are all really set to uh, to look forward to a great 2023-24. Uh, so, very quickly, in terms of the last three pillars that will help us grow next year, uh, at the center, of course, is the key and our proprietary growth score three model. Uh, on the asset side, the asset side continues to grow very strongly with four, four, four and a half thousand crores of uh, disbursements last year and a 1400 plus crores of uh, disbursements in quarter four. Uh, somewhere, the exit run rates in March are between 550 to 600 crores and they will continue to slow the inch up so that gives a sense of where we will reach by end of next year somewhere in the five digit uh, uh, AUM, AUM range. Uh, we will continue to uh, build our, uh, in fact we will continue to now sweat our infrastructure and our uh, digital platforms and ensure that the current OPEX delivers far more than what, than what we delivered last year. On the other side, our uh, liability platform is only getting robust by the day. Apart from the 10 co-lending partners and the co partners that support our uh, last model, which is lending, uh, lending as a service model, we have 66 lenders on board now, uh, and our liability is only looking robust by the day. So with these three pillars of uh, a very strong asset engine, a robust risk model, and a very uh, and a, a, a liability engine that is ready to power up uh, power our asset engine growth. I think next year looks extremely promising for all of us uh, in new growth. Uh, having said this, I will now let the, I'll now open the floor for uh, uh, for uh, questions. I will let the moderator instruct the participants on how to take it forward. Thank you very much. We will now begin the question and answer session. To ask a question, please click on the raise hand icon available on the toolbar or you may click on Q&A icon to raise hand. The operator will announce your name when it is your turn to ask a question. Please accept the prompt on your screen and unmute your microphone while proceeding with your question. To ask a text question, you may click on the text tab available on the top on clicking the Q&A tab and type your question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. We have a first question from Vikash Mistri from Moonshot Ventures. Please go ahead. Mr. Mistri. Please unmute your microphone and ask your question. Hi, Vikas, are you asking the question? Because if you are unable to unmute or not being able to speak, you can put your question in the chat box and we'll respond, uh, you know, there, those questions as well. Thank you. We'll take our next question from the line of Rishi Kesh and retail investor. Please go ahead. Hello. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, you are. Yes. Hi, Mr. Session. I mean, uh, congratulations on a great set of numbers uh, yet again. Um, I do have a couple of questions with regards to how the business on the uh, Grow X is going to be like. I mean, do we have control over what the funds are being used uh, when it's app-based lending? 
or is it on a particular purpose where we actually end up paying their vendors or their suppliers? So this, uh, you know, this app-based lending uh, which we have launched, it is basically to serve the needs, need of this very small merchant. So think of a scenario of a small retail store which does daily buying in the morning and does the sale for a whole day and next day morning or two days when he has an excess cash, he wants to return the money. Uh, so we, uh, you know, uh, so he can get the credit limit uploaded into the app. He can use and dispense the money through UPI and other method. Uh, so at the time of dispensation of our credit, uh, we will not be able to control where the money is going. But what we can control that we are only allowing Uddhya Madhar registered entities to avail the credit, which means that the credit is being given only to a business entity and it is not a loan to for consumption purposes. It's not a personal loan. Over a period of time, and that is the best, you know, when differentiate between bank and us, uh, we will try to, you know, perfect and we will do very specific need-based lending. But at, at the initial phase wherein we want to get more customer, we want our data to get more mature, uh, we have not defined it for the end purpose. But we have a presumption is that 80 to 90 percent loan given to business entity would be used for business purposes only. Understood. Thanks a lot. Uh, I have another question. So is there any uh, statistics available on how the Grow Extreme platform is currently performing without you grow being a part of the deal, like uh, deals between NBFCs and banks where you grow is just taking a fee? No, sir. We have not opened our platform for that purpose. So we are still not a platform play. Uh, you grow, grow Extreme platform is predominantly connects our distribution origination to our bank partner. Uh, and some of the banks actually are using third party platform because they don't want to connect to just one lender's platform. And so as other lenders also don't want to connect to one lender platform. So till the time we fully mature, we have not monetized the platform as a platform play. It is it is currently playing a role of facilitation uh, for Ugro ecosystem. Understood. One final question, if I may. So this is on the equity fundraise that uh, was recently done from the Danish government. So uh, I was trying to understand the uh, the background for this. I mean, it, it is a substantial dilution in terms of them becoming almost the largest shareholders now. Uh, does this mean they would participate in future rounds like um, to reduce our cost of capital by way of bonds or foreign currency bonds or uh, NCDs, etc.? Is that... Uh, envision to happen like that? They are not our largest shareholders, sir. Uh, their shareholders is, is exactly equal to what uh, TPG and ADB Capital have. So they will also be roughly around 16.5% uh, or near about. So as the TPG and the, uh, and the ADB as well. Uh, to cover purpose in this round of capital was to ensure that on our <coughs> cap table, we have certain number of shareholders who have longevity of or the duration uh, because lending as a business is a business of duration and that's why we found it appropriate to attract a dfi because as you know as a sovereign entities uh, these entities have the capacity to hold uh, the equity stake for a very very long period of time second uh, one of the source of our financing is impact financing because we are we are building a very robust impact financing business and also we are focusing on you know renewable and sustainability and that's why as the third largest European DFI, our, uh, you know, our uh, recognition within the DFI world would increase with you know, they coming on our capital structure. And we see that during this year, almost all large DFIs would be on the lender side. Generally, sir, uh, in the DFI balance, when they take the equity exposure, actually equity exposure is calculated four times you know, to debt exposure and it actually reduces their capacity of debt to us. Uh, so most of whether it is IFU, DG, Propaco, IFC, uh, they don't, when they put an equity money, they don't put debt money simultaneously. But what we have also seen, and we have seen this in during the period of COVID very effectively, DFIs generally support their existing, what they call client, at the time of stress. So all DFIs in the world have special programs for their existing client during COVID period, and they supported all their portfolio companies by debt support at that period of time, and that's why... We feel confident that at a time, point of time when we will need money, you know, investors like uh, IFU would be very, very supportive. 
All right, thank you very much. That's perfect from me. Uh, good luck with the coming problems. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, to ask a question, please click on the raise hand icon available on the toolbar or you may click on Q&A icon to raise hand. We'll take our next question from the line of Nirvana Laha, an individual investor. Please go ahead. Hi, uh, am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You. Yeah. yeah, thank you so much for taking my question. Uh, so, um, uh, what about the cost of, how do you see the cost of borrowing trending in FY24? And another question on the cost front, how many branches uh, do you see opening beyond 98 and FY24? Sure, Amit. So, on, uh, as we have seen recently, that uh, inflation is getting sl slowly under control. So, April month inflation numbers are very encouraging, where the retail inflation has come down to 4.7%. And in fact, WPI has gone into negative, uh, which has happened after almost 18 months. And RBI has also taken a pause in their last meeting. Uh, so what we internally believe and general belief in the uh, borrowing market is that we have plateaued as far as in, uh, cost of uh, borrowing is concerned. Uh, from here on, we may see some amount of uh, some time where the cost will remain uh, similar, which is uh, of course on the higher side. And then we may see a cycle of uh, lowering down, uh, which, which is periodic period. So for this year, we don't anticipate uh, significant in increase in the cost of uh, borrowing. For our plan purpose, we have taken it as flattish. On uh, number of branches and cost of office, I'm in building. So uh, <clears throat> on the number of branches, uh, one would have seen that over last year, uh, post Q1, we really did not in, in, we did not set up any new branches and the number has been stagnant. And there was a reason. Uh, we set up about 75 branches in Q4 and Q1, Q4 of 21, 22, 21, 22, and 20, uh, the early part of 21, 23. And uh, we wanted to see the proof of concept that these branches can break even between 12 to 15 months. These were essentially the micro enterprise loan branches the 75 branches that we have in Rajasthan, uh, Gujarat, Karnataka, Tamil Nadu and Telangana. As we now approach about 12 months, we have seen that most of our branches have actually reached a break-even point. Our average productivity of our branches is higher than our peer set, of, uh, peer set. And so now we are confident that we will be able to now scale up. We will give another quarter or so for this to really mature and understand that all our branches break even. But having said this, in the first two quarters, we will open between 20 to 25 micro enterprises branches and we will take a call uh, in the last quarter on further expansion. Uh, eventually, in the next 24 to 30, 30 months, we will have about total 250 branches across the country. Okay, and with that number, you think you're on track to hit the uh, cost to income ratio that you've targeted for FI25 or are you running above budget? No, absolutely. So like I said, we are only talking about 20 incremental micro-enterprise branches, which are low-cost branches that we will be expand, expanding. So OPEX in that sense is really flat this year. And with the AUM growth happening, we will see our cost-to-income ratios touch the desired uh, levels of 47% by the year. Okay. And one more follow-up question on the branches. So um, the prime branches, you say that it's intermediated. So uh, can you explain what that means? Is it 100% DSA or is it our own employees? So the prime branches have multiple products. It has the standard loan against property and the unsecured loans as one set of product. It also has equipment finance and supply chain finance as the ecosystem products in the prime branches that we do. The prime products or rather the loan against property and the business loan products are DSA driven and intermediated. Uh, the equipment finance, the supply chain, and our our direct to customer product is is there is no intermediation. So the prime branches houses both these businesses, and so it that that, that in that ratio it does have the intermediary business. Okay, so at an overall disbursement level, can you tell us what percentage is sourced through DSAs and what percentage is uh, sourced through our own employees? Fifty six percent at this point of time on the overall disbursement is uh, intermediated. The rest is direct. Uh, I must, but uh, I must add, uh, I think so, 
uh, intermediate it doesn't mean that we don't have distribution cost or sales front end actually large portion of our sales forces and what we call you know the upper end of the sales force you know relative per person cost being higher are actually in prime branches because there is a twin level of servicing which is required because we compete with the intermediaries because they are open architecture intermediaries to get through the door and then we have to ultimately serve the customer to get through you know uh, get them accept our offer and take the loan so actually you know the only the hunting part is not done by us but you know post origination by the intermediary to get through the client to our system is all done by our sales forces okay got it and final question from my side last quarter i think uh, you had confirmed that the tax hits from the labs dtas are over so can you um, just confirm that for this fy24 are we foreseeing any further uh, tax hits uh, no sir actually uh, the carry forward uh, deferred tax uh, which is still there in the balance sheet is about 10 crores uh, out of which 6.9 crore is coming uh, for labs in the coming year uh, so uh, pro profit has to absorb it uh, uh, for the year 23 24 so that part uh, that portion is about 6.9 crore okay all right thank you so much thank you Ladies and gentlemen, in order to ensure that the management is able to address queries from all participants, kindly restrict your question to one at a time. You may join back the queue for follow-up questions. We have a next question from the line of Darshil Pandya from FinInterest Capital. Please go ahead. Uh, hello, sir. Good evening. Congratulations Good evening. for the wonderful set of numbers. Uh, sir, I have a few of the follow-up questions from the uh, previous call. So last time you said that, you know, you are always open for uh, evaluating any other sector to add up in the, uh, for the uh, loans. So have you uh, evaluated any of the new sectors to be added up? Anuj? Yeah, hi. Uh, so we keep evaluating uh, 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 sectors, but at this point of time, so we have nine sectors. Eight sectors uh, which we started with and ninth we added uh, during the course of the journey. And also uh, as a policy of uh, about 20% of the total portfolio, we have deliberately kept it open for all other sectors so that whenever uh, we choose to open, we have some kind of data to make rules. But at this point in time, uh, with the state of macroeconomy and the way the sectors are performing, uh, we are not thinking of opening up anything new. Within uh, la the light instinct sector uh, and electrical equipments, uh, they have been very interesting subsectors which have opened up, especially on the green energy and solar. Uh, and those, though are part of our large sector list, have thrown open uh, new opportunities for us. So at the, for, for the near to medium term, we don't see any reason to open uh, a new sector, but of course we will keep exploring interesting opportunities within other sectors which we work with. Okay. Uh, and as you said on the last time, you know, you are, uh, you would be uh, increasing the mix of off-book and on-book AUM. So right now it's at 40 to 60%. 40% is for the off-book and 60% is on the on-book. Uh, where do you see this mix coming, like going forward? Going forward, we will steadily uh, increase the percentages of off-book. Uh, as a stated objective, we have said that by year 2025, we will reach 50% as of book and 50% on the balance sheet. Uh, so we are slightly ahead of time in terms of achieving our of book numbers. Uh, so this year, uh, we have achieved slightly more than what we have envisaged on on book side. Next year, we will reach closer to 47% on uh, of book and 53% will remain uh, on balance sheet. But the ultimate goal is to reach 50-50. Okay. One final question, sir. Uh, Mr. Pandya, one I request you to come back in the queue, sir. Uh, okay, thank you. Thank you. We system. have a next question from the line of GMO PG India Private Limited. Kindly announce your name and go ahead with your question, please. Hello, uh, am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes. Yes, uh, I'm Piyush Bhotra from uh, GMO PG India. So, uh, congratulations on the tremendous growth in the AUM. So, uh, my question is on the next uh, 
for this year AUM. Uh, so last year you almost doubled the AUM and this year as well it is pretty uh, aggressive on the AUM side. So for the on balance uh, AUM, how much will be funded by equity and how much do you plan to fund it by debt if you can share? Uh, so I will take this question. Uh, so next, the, for this for, uh, full 12 months, so we are not envisaging further equity infusion. So the 340 crore which has come in, uh, that would be the only equity infusion for this uh, 12 months uh, starting from April 2023. Uh, and balance of the entire balance sheet growth would come from debt. Uh, so this year we have planned for raising about 2500 crore of uh, fresh liability uh, uh, for the whole year. So do, do you feel any stress on the uh, capital adequacy with uh, no, no equity? In? So we had, we ended the year with a capital adequacy of 20%, uh, 20.23%. And then over and above uh, in April and May, we have raised 340 crores. So if I take that back into 31st March, roughly we are around 30% of capital adequacy, uh, which will be sufficient uh, uh, to cater all the needs for this entire year. and. Uh, uh, we don't see uh, capital adequacy going below the current level for the full year with this equity raise. Okay, so 20%. Is it 20% or yeah. below 30%? Yeah, 20%. Okay, thank you. Thank you. We have our next question from the line of Agastya Dave from CAO Capital. Please go ahead. Hello, am I audible? Yes. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, sir, I had one question on your uh, machine learning model. Uh, can you tell us something, about, first of all, the rejection rates? So uh, how many people approach you and out of that, how many people uh, do not get a loan from you? Because you say no. So Irrespective uh, of the five buckets, irrespective of where they uh, stand in the five buckets, uh, how many people do you deny loans to? So on an average, uh, this can this varies uh, by product, but on an average for full portfolio, for every 100 customers who apply, we give loans to 30. Okay, so 70% rejection rates. Yes. Great. Uh, uh, a related question, uh, uh, how many false positives do you see where uh, probably uh, like the error error rate in your in your model? where you predict that uh, default won't happen, but it happens, uh, and the other way around, where you think that default would happen and it doesn't happen. So all the true true positives, false positives, false neg negatives, and true negatives, uh, do you have that data with you? So this is, uh, 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 it is about probabilities. Uh, yeah. uh, and our model is, is giving a probability, and the model has a Gini coefficient, uh, and all okay. our mod models have a Gini coefficient of more than 50%. But but to I get the gist of your question. Broadly, uh, you uh, you are asking uh, by risk bands if the probability of default for next 12, 12 months at a portfolio level was X percent. Do you right. uh, after 12 months what do you see? Is that the yeah, question? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. After yeah. Very similar. Yeah. Yes. So so we have seen. Uh, uh, that it is very similar to what the model is predicted. In absolute terms, it may not match exactly, but from trending terms, uh, it is directly uh, uh, what the, our score has been predicting. Okay. Okay. So, given a uh, uh, so so loss given default, uh, what, what kind of losses do we see if a default happens? So, uh, uh, loss. Uh, so, uh, our scores. Uh, our probability focused on probability of default. Loss given default mm. is a function of collateral and our mm. litigation ability. So as mm. so in our own experience so far, uh, the loss given default on secured loan is close to zero. On okay. uh, loss given defaults on unsecured loan is relatively higher, uh, uh, okay. but it is not hundred percent. And, and generally, what is the percentage of secured loans that you have? We, uh, of the total portfolio, 70% of the portfolio is secured. W with what kind of LTV? So, uh, uh, I will divide this into two. Uh, secured uh, uh, is, uh, uh, is for hard collateral, either property or machinery. 
for property on an average the portfolio ltvs are around 52% or okay. machinery the portfolio ltv would be closer to 70% okay okay that's reasonable that's pretty reasonable uh, one final question sir uh, uh, the only thing which comes out like two things which are slightly problematic at least from my point of view as of now uh, and i could be completely uh, wrong uh, proven completely wrong in the future one is that you guys have a very low roe and where do you see this roe finally settling once you reach a state which is more steady state where do you see this roe settling uh and uh, the second thing is the growth is like way too aggressive way way too aggressive so uh where do you see uh a, like a normalized growth rate for you um uh how will these two numbers finally settle can i take this how, uh how, how okay. and when actually how and when how and when yeah so think of uh, this uh, so i i presume you are in bombay right yes sir okay so there are multiple ways people make convention centers right or make banquet hall so think of somebody making a small banquet hall uh, then that goes to full capacity then they make another banquet hall uh, and then make a third banquet hall but it may so happen that the land parcel near to your first banquet hall may not be available so that's the one way yeah. to do it and second is you have seen geos convention center right where you take large land parcel and you make a large convention center and such large convention center when it would happen then first event itself would have you know 5 7 lakh people coming into that so you grow and be designed and built like that we raised you know significant amount of capital without having any business right on a piece of paper 1000 crore equal capital then we bought yeah. all the land and will build a large building and now that large building is being utilized for its capacity so our growth rate is not a function of surprise it is a function of upfront capacity which has been built personally speaking i still think so that our capacity is underutilized and it's a function of our liability funnel and we could have been you know much better we are growing at this rate when you have just heard that our approval rate is only 30% so for a month of mm. march uh, when we dis- disbursed 600 odd crore we originated 2400 crore loan so which means that we have kept our credit completely tight but still the funnel is very big and that's why it is throwing big numbers second question and i will uh, kishore can give you the numbers is again the same because you have built all capacity up front then obviously that up front capacity you know uh, you know would yield little bit of time to generate the bottom line performance so this company has moved right. from a 20 crore of pbt last year to 86 84 crore this year and as you have right. just heard the com- commentary from amit that you know now we are not increasing the opex and on the current mm-hmm. run rate basis we will touch roughly around 10000 crore of aem which means your bottom line performance from the current 84 crore would be at least two and a half three times so we would be mm-hmm. into the median roe you know a two digit roe number you know in the current year and we'll be mm-hmm. near to you know high double digit roe number near year forward uh, kishore if i'm correct yeah absolutely so this year we will try our level best to hit double digit uh, digit uh, from single digit where we are uh, and the year after uh, we will be into high teens at let's say 20 25000 crore aum uh, can you guys pay around uh, like 18 20% roes uh, is that the scalability uh, matrix that i should keep my eye on uh, whenever that happens yes. i'm not asking for timeline sir no no but we are we are working on a timeline i think so you know somewhere near about that and that's why in few quarters back we have actually put a very number and that number one more aspirational uh, but you know 1000 crore here and there you miss but our target to get to the kind of roe number is by end of 2025 or so around 18% 18 20% great sir uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, thank you thank you very much sir uh, uh, the process seems very interesting uh, 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 all the best sir thank you Thank you. We'll take a next question from Dishant, an individual investor. It's a text question. What will your FY24 outlook be? Sure, you want to take that? 
so FY24, as we have discussed during our uh, previous uh, deliberation, that uh, we have a robust pipeline in terms of uh, overall infrastructure. We have closed March month uh, within disbursement of closer to 600 crore. Uh, so this year, full year, we have planned for uh, disbursement of close to 6,400 crore, and we will uh, be achieving a AUM, try to achieve AUM of 10,000 crore uh, with an ROA of 3.1% and ROA of about 10%. Uh, uh, so this is the plan uh, which has been approved by uh, our board uh, during our February meeting and we are working on that. Thank you, sir. We'll take our next question from the line of Falguni Mahaja from Scient Capital Private Limited. Please go ahead. Falguni Mahaja. Hello. Please, un uh, yes, please go ahead. Uh, can you guide me on your net interest margins over the year and for the quarter as well? And what is your target for FY24? So this year uh, on the balance sheet basis, uh, on balance sheet basis, it is roughly around 12.8% uh, and if we take the AUM, it is roughly around 9%, 8.9% uh, for the year. Uh, so that trend will continue with some variation uh, based on the product mix uh, uh, and other factors. So this is where we are and uh, the range is likely to be in that range. Okay, thank you. Thank you. We have a text question from Neeraj Jain from NJ Investments. The question is, after DBZ Cyprus sold its shares, what comes as an unpleasant surprise is another major shareholder, Chhattisgarh Investments Limited, which was recently allocated shares as part of the recent QIP, also sold a big chunk of shares. Is the management aware of the reason why CIL sold so soon after QIP? I think so. The price has gone up too quickly. Thank you. One moment, sir. We have a text question from Siddharth Arur, an independent investor. Congratulations on strong set of numbers. Though the NPAs have reduced from 2% to 1.6% in March 23 on absolute basis, GNPAs have increased materially. What is the company doing to arrest this? Okay, I'll take that. Uh, so I am not very sure uh, what the question meant. Uh, because on absolute terms, as AUM goes up, NPS will go up. That is the business model we have. But to, uh, overall, from modeling perspective, uh, on for each of our business vertical, we have a budget, uh, or, or NPA budget, and that is how the gross code models have been worked out. So, uh, 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 as a general uh, philosophy, for an unsecured business, at a yield of 19%, uh, we are okay to go up to 3, 3.5% 3 NPS lifetime. For a secured loan uh, uh, backed by uh, a, a hard collector-like property, we are fine to go uh, up to 0 0.5 to 0.75% NPA in the, in the lifetime. And so far, uh, we have been well below that, uh, but our uh, scores and our underwriting have been calibrated so that we don't Cross these benchmarks. No, so no, the absolute absolute number of JNP has increased, but as a percentage, it has come down, and that is way that is how uh, uh, this has to be looked at. Thank you. We have a text question from Pramod Jain from Purushottam Investor Fin Limited. When you intend to raise next capital. As you moving up the ladder in the world of financing, where you will face interest war. Since you are still A-rated, so your cost of funds will be much higher than your peers. 
how will you be able to meet the competition? Um, you sure you want to take this? Uh, so, next round of capital, as we have said in our commentary earlier, that uh, for this full year, we are not looking at raising any, uh, uh, any equity. Uh, probably uh, in the mid of next year, we will look at another round of equity for the growth capital. Uh, on the interest rate side, uh, of course, uh, uh, the, uh, there can be views uh, by anyone, but as an institution, what we believe and what we are working upon is that uh, we have uh, proven ourselves to the markets, to our lenders, uh, with our transparency, our governance, and our uh, underwriting model, uh, uh, robustness of our underwriting model, and it will pay, uh, pay a dividend at some point of time. And I personally believe that the uh, time has arrived uh, where uh, people would give some premium of all the efforts that hard work that has gone into this company for last four years, uh, the uh, robust underwriting model that it has created, the governance model the company uh, has uh, been demonstrating uh, over the entire journey of five years, and our transparency in uh, disclosures and data to all sets of investors, whether it is equity investors or our lenders, uh, where we will get some advantage. So this is my personal belief. There is no science around it. Uh, that uh, as a team, we believe that our cost of fund uh, should come down proportion to the markets. Of course, it is open market where rates can go up and down, but we will have some advantage over our peers uh, as we move forward. Uh, if I may add, uh, Mr. Jain, I think so one of the cardinal principle of lending is vintage. So there are two formats of businesses. Businesses wherein the cost of borrowing is a function of parentage. Uh, so there are, you know, uh, there are entities which are maybe much younger, you know, five years, six years, you know, may have a cost of borrowing which reflects the cost of borrowing of who their parent is. So obviously they have a disproportionate advantage vis-a-vis uh, us, but actually they are our partners, most of them. All those such entities are actually doing business with us, so that shows, uh, you know, our capabilities. Second, uh, there is always an inflection point. I'll give you an example of, say, AU, uh, which, you know, in the first 10 years of its journey, actually started as a, I think, so triple B minus company and then went to a double A plus. In current uh, world, you know, look at five star, which is into the microest of the micro enterprises segment, uh, which was it started as a double B plus company and now double A minus company. As long as you continue on your vintage journey, maintain credit costs, create healthy growth, and generate bottom line performance, your cost of borrowing and rating both would start improving. So I think so with every passing year, that would keep happening for us, like it has happened for many other institutions in India. Thank you. We have a text question from Krishna Kumar Srinivasan from Lion Hill Capital. Can you give us a sense of incremental, one moment please. Can you give us a sense of incremental credit risk assessment done by your co-lenders? I can take that. So look, uh, <clears throat> the way the co-lending for regulations have been formulated and where it get differentiated between a direct assignment or a portfolio sale, banks as under the RBI circular of co-lending, which is November 2020, are mandated to do customer level underwriting. So there are two things which banks have to do. One, they have to pre-agree the policy framework under which the loan would be given. So now actually all the banks, uh, you know, look at our policy and with some variation actually adopt our policy. This is the biggest change which has come because of our vintage of portfolio, our portfolio performance. More or less they are aligning them themselves to our policy. Then once we disburse a customer, when the file moves either through technology or through, you know, digital formats, then they are obligated to check every parameter of the policy and whether the loan is as per policy or not. So to that extent, it is a work which banks have to do. And this is where a banking system is getting more comfortable because they are taking actual customer level risk uh, and not the entity level risk. Um, so that is the way, you know, it is happening right now. Kishore, if you want to add, or Anuj, Amit, you want to add something? No, this more or less covers that. Thank you. 
we have a live question from the line of Sanjay Kumar Elangovan from I Thought PMS. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, first question: So, if I look at uh, Prime Unsecured, thousand nine hundred crores AUM and GNPA of two point nine percent, which is roughly fifty five crores. So, if I look at this absolute GNPA against one year ago AUM of thousand crores Prime Unsecured, it is five point five percent. And even if I take six months ago AUM of thousand two hundred crores, roughly four point five percent GNPA, the lag GNPA. So, so comments on this. Uh, is it, do you think, at least in your view, is it deterioration in asset quality? One, two, the covenants in our borrowing, are they for overall AEM or is it product specific? So I'll take that. Uh, so uh, out of the total 55 crore uh, GNP in unsecured book, a uh, little less than 30 crore ha has come up, come out from the restructured book during COVID. So, uh, uh, so, um, uh, 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 sourcing post COVID, uh, post we implemented gross code 2.0 is actually very, very healthy and we have hardly seen anything. Uh, so, uh, to your question of how do we foresee this, uh, uh, we will see some bit of recovery because some of those restructured stress portfolio also are now coming back alive. Uh, but from the, on the new portfolio source and we have been tracking this, uh, on vintage curves, uh, very, very, uh, closely, we don't foresee uh, the gross NPS for lifetime to go above three to three and a half percent. On the covenant, uh, on the covenant side, there are no specific product specific covenant. It is uh, on the most of the time it is uh, on the AUM of the company, and very few cases it would be on the on balance sheet AUM. Uh, uh, so no, no product specific. Uh, covenant is there for any of our borrowing lines. Okay, sir. Uh, thank you. Second, on uh, <clears throat> provision coverage, so we are at uh, 49%. So how comfortable are you, again, uh, or looking at the overall PCR kind of cure, misuse, uh, because okay, can you so can you provide the product-wise PCR, especially for the unsecured uh, loans? So uh, uh, to answer the first question first, uh, now we are uh, hitting... Uh, kind of our desired uh, numbers on provision coverage. We are actually uh, quite comfortable internally. We had benchmark uh, it to be between 45 to 50. Uh, it is actually a function of the, the portfolio mix in stage three, the kind of products and the kind of uh, estimates uh, or from the ground of how our litigation and collection action is taking fruit. Uh, 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 on a broad level, uh, for unsecured, uh, the provision coverage is closer to 65 to 70 percent. On secured, uh, it would be closer to 20, between 20 to 30 percent. Okay, and uh, is it, yeah, it's okay. We'll take one more. Go ahead. Just a product specific question. So, so, so uh, GNPA is also higher in uh, supply chain financing, although the yields are very uh, similar to your prime secured uh, kind of yields. So, so. Why is this divergence, sir? And why are the yields so high in micro enterprise loans? Uh, so I'll answer the first question, uh, second question first. Uh, on the micro uh, segment, uh, we do secured loans up to 25 lakh for micro enterprises at on an average yield of about 21%. And uh, we do unsecured loans up to 5 lakh uh, specifically for micro enterprises at around 24%. So that's the way market is. Uh, when uh, the way we have defined this uh, is uh, uh, on on measuring the quality of cash flow, the quality of collateral, uh, and the quality of repayment behavior. So so for micro customer, all these three are not standard uh, uh, and less than prime, and that is how uh, uh, the risk based pricing has been arrived at. On the supply chain. On the supply chain, uh, uh, yes, you are right. Uh, the NPAs are higher, uh, but if you would have uh, seen our journey, uh, uh, this is on account of two large anchor going, anchors going bust uh, during the just before COVID, and uh, this this NPA number used to be around a little higher than four percent. We have been successfully able to able to recover part part of that 
uh, 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 stressed assets and in next two to three quarters is, it is expected that we will recover more. For everything sourced after that, we have hardly seen any forward flows. And last part of your question which you asked that yields look similar to some of our other secured product. Actually, we are graduating from uh, you know, from a vendor-based financing to purchase-based financing, uh, which means that we are now financing the distribution chains of anchors. So, uh, you know, anchor to distributor, distributor to retailer, you know, that's why you will see an uptick in, in the yields curve. Second, sir, we look price and duration both. Uh, so, one of the great advantage of supply chain portfolio is its duration because it's a short tenor duration because we have to ensure that we have all liquidity profile of assets in our balance sheet. Uh, because we get all, uh, liquid, uh, you know, on the liability side also, we get all kind of duration of loans. So just having only long duration loans are not sustainable uh, if you're not a bank. So that's why we mix product uh, by, you know, LGD calculation, by collateral. We mix product by duration. Uh, and we also look at what gives us the broad market access. So some of our products, uh, supply chain, machinery finance, grow X, actually are product which are bringing the funnel of large customer bases wherein in future massive cross-sell would happen. So every supply chain financing or a dealer or a retailer is a customer where in 12 months to 18 months time, I would be able to cross-sell a machine, I'll be able to cross-sell a rooftop solar, I'll be able to cross-sell a secured loan, so on and so forth. So I think so that is the philosophy why we are doing certain businesses. Uh, thanks for the clarification because that was my last uh, question or request. You could add the average tenure along with the ticket size and ROA. Uh, we will do that. The, it was supposed right. to be done this time. We have missed it. We will do it, sir. Perfect. Thank you. That's it from my side. Thank you. We have a next question from Saptashri Chatterjee from Central PMS. Please go ahead. Saptashri Chatterjee. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Am I audible? Yes. Yes. Uh, thanks for the opportunity, sir. So my question is in terms of one is if you can talk about how much should be your in-house origination versus outside like DSA-based origination. So we actually uh, kind of touched upon and answered this question. So our intermediate uh, origination is about 55, 55%. Uh, the rest, 45% is direct origination at RI. And if you can talk about also your collection infrastructure, I mean, what would be your maybe 30 DPD and like how many collection agents you would be having? Also, our plan, like one will be touching, let's say, 10,000 crore kind of AUM. What would be our plan to how many collection agents we'll be having on the board, on the field? Oh, I'll, I'll take that. Uh, so uh, our total uh, stage one assets uh, are around 96.1%. And uh, if you see uh, uh, last few preceding quarters, uh, it has remained that way. So which basically means our 30 plus uh, is in the range of 3.8 to 3.9%. Uh, going forward, we don't see too much, too many changes in this kind because the way the portfolio construct is and depend and in each product, the way the risk cutoffs are uh, for, for approvals and, and, and rejects. On the collection infrastructure, uh, we have a very large in-house team uh, uh, um, aided by a large litigation team and an early warning system uh, which is uh, uh, developed by the in-house analytics team which gives uh, uh, early warning signals for the current assets to the in-house call center and hence, uh, so there's a very large uh, infrastructure which we have built. Uh, from numbers perspective, we have close to 180 uh, 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 resources in collections. And as the portfolio grows up, uh, that number will steadily grow up. Sure. And uh, if you can also quantify uh, for the year, uh, FI23, what would be the slippage and then uh, the upgradation and recovery and write-off number for FI23? So in FI23, we have hardly taken any write-off. Uh, sure. um, uh, so, and from slippages perspective, uh, the trend which we have seen uh, uh, so far, uh, approximately uh, once an account becomes an NPA, uh, approximately two to three percent of that per month is what we have been able to roll back in unsecured loans. In secured loans, we have been able to roll back almost hundred percent of cases. 
within 12 months. And last one question, last question from my side is if you can like uh, give us two, three insights, which is like from your machine learning models versus your gross score of 2.0 to gross score of 3.0, which are the key learnings and key upgradations that we have done. Thank you. So uh, the, the, the primary uh, addition uh, from gross score 2.0 to gross score 3.0 is the GST uh, parameter. So we have we have always always been using GST, but primarily as an eligibility tool. But in gross code 3.0, what we have done is we have added that as a statistical parameter, and all the all the data features which can emanate from uh, uh, the GST return, we have added that. The primary hypothesis is that the earliest warning signal for a stressed customer is not the bureau not the banking, but the GST. Bureau takes typically four to five months lag before a stress is reported. Banking uh, uh, early warning is little better, but still one doesn't know till the check bounces. But in GST, the moment the sales starts going down, that is the first and your primary early warning signal. Uh, we, uh, uh, this was our hypothesis. And with this, we built and included that as a major parameter in gross score. Understood, sir. Thank you. And congratulations on the great set of results. Thank you. Thank you. We have a next question from Shubham Sethi, an individual investor. Please go ahead. Um, hi, sir. Can you hear me? Yes. Hey, I'm back. Okay, yeah. So uh, my question is regarding the so in the presentation we have given a sample illustration where we compare the on balance sheet versus the co lending model. So uh, there is a field called uh, so I understand uh, the co lending spread income, but there is some uh, other income as well, which is around uh, 1200. Uh, this is on page number 38 of the slide, uh, slide 38. So I'm trying to understand what is the other income because it's a significant part of the co-lending model. Just hold on, we're just opening the slide, hold on. Sure. So it is the primary the fee of, uh, processing fees and documentation charges etc uh, which is normally attached at the time of uh, origination okay so it's a one time uh, thing that happens when the loan is originated am i correct or it's not like uh, for the entire duration of the loan uh, no, no. like the the spread no this is one time okay uh, understood uh, another question I had was uh, basically uh, uh, in uh, like uh, we, most of the banks that we have co-lending uh, with are uh, I'm not talking about the NBFC I'm talking about the big banks are mostly uh, the uh, government banks uh, state banks right uh, so like any plans to add uh, private banks uh, also like any uh, or like uh, any big banks because uh, um, that will give us like even more confidence and why you would say that. I mean, uh, like of the like it's, it's more uh, like forgive my uh, like naivety, uh, but like if you see like most of the scams and all right, they, there's a perception that they happen in in like government banks, and so that is why like I mean there is I mean I may not be hundred percent correct, but so sir, may I remind I mean, you that uh, each, more of may I perception. remind you that in India, the banks which have undergone and have got busted were only private sector banks. Global Trust Bank, Yes Bank, and multiple cooperative banks, uh, and all. You know, so that always happens to the private sector banks. So that's point number one. Number two, you are also making the same assumption and the presumption that private sector banks are superior when it comes to their understanding of uh, the credit. But you should also remember all of the people who are seeing over here, and the rest of the 17, 1800 people who work for Ugro also have come from the same set of the bank. So in terms of the intellectual caliber. Uh, in terms of the years which we have spent is no less than those banks. Number three, 
why actually the first port of call for us is public sector bank because in india the custodian of the money is public sector bank because all general public have more trust and faith in the public sector banking system so that the liquidity always flow to them but that does not necessarily mean that they have the same comparable infrastructure on the asset side so that's why they are more hungry on the asset side than the private sector bank uh, and the last in last 5 7 years majority of the private sector banks have grown on basis of wholesale credit and that's why this at this uh, you know this half decade or next 4 uh, 5 years they are very very focused on retail growth of their own and that's why there is less uh, you know motivation for them to add indirect sources of origination like co lending but uh, since all of you are keep asking this question uh, over a period of next this quarter and next quarter mm -hmm. there will be at least two three private sector banks which we would add we have more number of private sector banks coming to mm -hmm. us but we are exhausted our asset side capacity to take on more co lending partners sorry i'm actually tired of this question Thanks. being asked multiple times that's why i have given you this answer no no i mean i truly understand but it's it's more of a perception thing and not more of, i mean it, it gives more more confidence to the uh, investors that's all yes sir i understand okay. thank you sir thank you we have a text question from sujay kamath there are two questions clearly you have developed some very strong tech how much of a moat do you think this is how do you compare yourselves with some of the tech driven nbfc like bajaj finance paytm and the second question is how much of your customer base has an overlap with the reliance group which is on the verge of entering fin uh i would take that and anuj uh, and amit you can add on to that number 1 i think so <clears throat> bajaj democratized the consumer credit in india starting from 2008 till 2000 uh, you know 23 in 2008 it was roughly around 7500 crore it is at 250000 or 275000 crore so an exp exponential growth of 45% cagr continuously for uh, almost 15 years that has happened because of three things bajaj brand cost of capital and third their early adoption of data but that data was consumer related data bureau existing loan loan data which they had and consumer behavior and that automated credit for consumer related loans i think so our moat is that what bajaj was able to do in 2008 9 10 11 post you know global financial crisis and what we have been able to create post covid crisis is exactly same so our moat is that when it comes to the msme financing in india we have a five year of head start in understanding the data and underwriting credit on the basis of data and which any other player into the market have to catch up with us so <clears throat> so that's one second uh, uh, you took two names on the tech driven nbfc only one of them is nbfc others is the only pure originator so i won't comment on that we have a text question from chetan bharat from vishnu bharat and company has the rbi started discouraging co lending if yes how does it affect you grow rbi is encouraging co lending sir so i think so one uh, <clears throat> one media report of in hindu business line uh, which has not been verified by anyone from rbi does not mean that rbi has discour discouraging co lending co lending is uh, <clears throat> if you look at from policy perspective uh government's uh, ease 4.0 has a stated objective of increasing the credit dissemination for priority sector through co lending it has a very well defined philosophy why both policy which is the government and the regulator want to increase the penetration of co lending this emanated from the default which happened from dhfl and few other large nbfcs banks exposure to nbfc one has a 100% risk weight second banks ability to control the enterprise level risk is very very limited so to balance that out and in, you know recognition of the fact that nbfc actually do the credit dissemination part to the deserving sector which otherwise banks are not being able to do this marriage was you know consummated 
so this was an arranged marriage done by the regulator and the government and it was not a love marriage to begin with but it is converting to love marriage and i don't think so that there is any apprehension or a rethinking from a policy perspective but every time it is the job of the regulator that anything when it grows the regulator has to ensure that the checks and balances are being maintained and nobody is exploiting the system but that's the journey that has happened for you know direct assignment that has happened for securitization that keep happening for every product into the market uh, but i would continue to believe that we have just seen you know tip of the iceberg uh, my presumption in next 2 3 years at the current base of the you know, uh, newspaper report which has quoted some number you will see at least 10 fold jumps from there we have a text question from pramod jain from parshottam investor fin you just said that cil may have exited because of quick price jump of mere 10% which is negligible for a long term investor it appears from the trade that this apparently is a negotiated deal since the company knows cil as they are your old investors is it in your knowledge who is the new investor uh yeah so this is true actually uh, cil has been invested in our uh, you know first series of capital raise they also came in this round as well uh, i and you know at the time of our qip we had more demand uh, than what what we have decided the qip and uh, actually you know cil has already committed our belief is that and we you know uh, you know we have not confirmed it with cil and not have not looked at data that some of the very large marquee public market investors have negotiated and bought that stake and that's why they were also willing to sell that stake to them we have a text question again from s bhatnagar an individual investor in the road map 2025 slides uh, shared earlier you have mentioned a target of 20000 plus crore aum by fy25 to reach that number AUM after FY23 was supposed to be 7000 plus crore we are around 900 crore short of that target so are we still targeting 20000 crore AUM for FY25 or that number will be revised so i think so look uh, when we give the when we gave our two year number that was in the context of uh, at that point of time you know because our base was very small we had a large capital we have a eum of 1300 only odd crore and uh, when we were giving big numbers you know informally that you know this is the aspiration of ours people were not you know presuming we wanted to put out that number that this company uh, you know its capital is structure its opex is structure its tech and people infrastructure is designed for a sizable organization so i don't think so we, you know we build businesses uh, you know as entrepreneurs for you know decades and multi decades and you know it's a, we are building a generational institution uh, so 1000 crore short in a one year and 2000 crore excess in another year actually doesn't matter we are in broadly in line to that aspirational number and even much bigger than that uh, but we'll see every year is a year which we have to pass and we have to complete that journey and there are multiple factors which play you know in that liability macros uh, overall economic scenario interest rate cycle uh but all thing remaining stable you will be very near to that number thank you sir ladies and gentlemen that was the last question for today i now hand the conference over to management for closing comments oh is it i am doing it okay so thank you very much uh, this uh, you know <clears throat> i think it was a very well spent one and a half hour uh, we saw a very big participation on our investor call our endeavor is uh, you know we are little different than most of the other lending institution and especially the nbfc you see uh, you know we are still very very early we are very humble uh, we have an aspiration to build an institution and this management team is working uh, tirelessly to do that uh, they are one of the large you know one of the large shareholder in terms of the esop 8% of the company's ownership in their hand uh, and we want to deliver an institution to india and that's why we take an extra effort uh, every you know now and then to keep explaining our business in detail and what is the difference and we are very thankful for all of you to listen to our you know all of this what we put up beyond what the numbers are thank you very much and we'll see you in end of the first quarter again
Thank you, sir. On behalf of Ugro Capital Limited, that concludes this conference. Thank you for joining us, and you may now disconnect your lines.